I should wait and decide whether you want to clap um, later. I wanted to thank Michael for inviting me to do this lecture uh, for two reasons. The first is that my name has never been in close proximity to the word distinguished before and uh, I can't imagine it ever will be again so this is a, a unique uh, opportunity for me. And the second reason is that many years ago when I was actively researching the social work labour process sometimes people would say to me uh, what's the research about and I'd get about 10 to 15 seconds into explaining what the research about only to see them glaze over and lose all interest in this uh, research in the labour process. So I also want to thank Michael for providing a captive audience of uh, people whose eyes will no doubt glaze over at the thought of uh, thinking about um, the labour <coughs> process. So I'm going to be talking about um, social work, obviously, and um, most of the time when we talk about social work, we tend to focus on the social end of social work. So we think about social problems, social issues, social processes, and uh, for those of you who are theoretically inclined, you'll know that there's a whole preoccupation in a lot of post-structuralist and post-modernist work with a domain that they refer to as the social, which, for example, in the governmentality literature, where they see the social as this kind of intermediate space between the state um, and people, in which all kinds of social and cultural uh, processes um, get played out. Um, but today, I want to concentrate on social work as work, okay? Uh, I was asked to speak about the labour process and that's very much about the idea of work and what social work means in terms of it being a job of work, okay? Now normally when I give lectures or gave lectures to students, I would uh, have them highly kind of structured and disciplined into clear sections and so on and take students through at the outset what the structure was going to be. I'm departing from that today and this is much more of a narrative about the labour process. Okay, so I want to take you on a kind of a historical journey through the social work labour process and I want to start the story here. Okay. So this is 1968 and particularly May 1968 and most of the countries in the Western world are convulsed by student protest in some countries by student protest and workers protest. For example in France uh, President de Gaulle has to flee the country as the students and workers uh, briefly uh, take over the country and so on. And of course there, were, there was a similar uh, kind of uh, student uh, movement in uh, this country as well. But also, as part of our story, in 1968, this person, Frederick Seabohm, produced the Seabohm Report. Now, I don't know if you know much about Seabohm, but Seabohm was a director of Barclays Bank it's international, eventually the chair of Barclays Bank International and when he wasn't busily lending money to the apartheid regime in uh, South Africa he was uh, prognosticating about social work, okay? And so uh, the report on his lap is the Seabohm report and uh, if you've studied the history of social work or social policy history you'll know that this was the report that set up um, social services departments. And in two respects, at least, I think, we can see the influence of uh, the 1960s and uh, the mood of 1968. Firstly, in the emphasis on community work 
as being integral to local authority social work and secondly in the proposal that every social services team should have an advisory form forum which oversaw the operation of the team and to which social workers would be accountable. Now that was never implemented, okay. But you can see that that's kind of part of this spirit of the time in terms of ideas about democracy and control and, and so on, okay. So, um, that's the next bit of the story, okay. 68, the Seabohm uh, report comes out. If we leap forward to 1974, this person, Harry Braverman, produced a very influential book called Labour and Monopoly Capital. Okay. Sadly, two years later, he died from cancer. And Braverman was a lathe turner. He wasn't an academic, he was a manual worker. And he produced this book called Labour and Monopoly Capital when he was a member of the uh, Socialist Worker Party uh, in the United States. Okay. So the first part of the story about the labour process is the way in which this book by an American manual worker was used to make sense of the establishment and the running of social services departments. So this is the Local Authority Social Services Act that put the Seabohm report into practice. And in, under, in, in order to understand how people were making sense of the labour process, we need to look at the way in which this book was incredibly influential in terms of the way people on the left understood the introduction of social services departments. But first, we need to kind of step back. I mean, if we're thinking of this as a narrative, this is a kind of flashback, if we were watching this as a, as a story on the screen. So we need to just step back a moment to, the, uh, to, to where the idea of the labour process comes from. I should have warned you actually right at the beginning, if there are people here of a nervous disposition, there is a little bit of Marxism in this, OK? Um, but we have enough social workers here to deal with you afterwards if you're traumatised and get you in a good frame of mind by the time you get back home again, okay. So, in Volume 1, Chapter 7 of Capital, which is probably one of the easiest chapters uh, to, to uh, read in uh, Capital, um, Marx moves into looking at the kind of inside of the production process, right? He wants to understand what's going on in the process of production. And what he says is, in any labour process, right, this isn't just about capitalism, in any labour process, there are three uh, components. First of all, there's purposeful activity. And uh, he made the famous distinction that's often quoted where he says, if you look at what bees do in terms of constructing honeycomb and so on, it's incredibly intricate. And, but the thing that distinguishes even the most intricate workings of nature from human activity <laughs> is its purposeful nature. The fact that human beings can think and conceive and advance and can plan and so on. So he sees this as a key component in the uh, labour process. And then he says... Um, but another component in the labour process is instruments of labour. And these are things or complexes of things that enable people uh, to work in purposeful activity, um, right, in order to produce something. And he calls what they produce use values. He doesn't really say very much about what he means by use values. He just says, well, these are things that are produced that meet human needs. So if we thought, for example, of the, uh, an example like a, a door or a table, uh, this is thought about in advance, it's purposeful activity, it's uh, produced by using instruments of labour and then it has a use value. Uh, it meets some kind of uh, human need. Okay. And so wh what Marx says is, this is the essence of the labour process in any sort of society, 
this, this is the process of labour uh, that people uh, go through. And then he says, in the capitalist labour process, there are two distinguishing uh, features. And they're the second and third on the list here. So he says, when we're looking at the capitalist labour process, we've still got this kind of universal labour process going on, but the thing that's distinctive about the capitalist labour process is that the worker works under the control of the capitalist. Okay, so he talks about the purchase of labour power, the potential for labour, but then the capitalist has to put it to work under her or his control. And he says the second distinctive feature is that the product is appropriated by the capitalist in order pr to produce surplus value, in order to produce profit. And he then says, uh, and this takes a particular form, the form is commodities. Capitalism produces things that are then sold uh, for profit. And he sees com commodities as being very, very important. If you read Capital, you'll know that he doesn't start capital by talking about the class struggle or the nature of capitalism or um, any other starting point he could have chosen. He begins with the commodity. That, that's where he starts from because he sees that as fundamental um, to uh, capitalism. Now, you might have thought that as capitalist society developed, Marxist, Marx's analysis would have been refined and refined and refined with the change in material conditions and cultural conditions under capitalism. That didn't happen. Um, not until Harry Braverman produced his book in 1974 uh, was there a kind of exegesis about uh, the Marxist theory of the labour process. Now, we could spend a long time saying, well, why was that? Uh, one of the explanations that Braverman gives is that when the Communist Party came to power in Russia, it used capitalist techniques like assembly lines and so on. Um, and Lenin and others argued that um, these techniques in themselves were neutral, that they could be put to work in the cause of state socialism, and they could be used to extend socialism. So Braverman says... Um, that in Marxist thought there was this shift where the techniques themselves were seen as uh, neutral um, and so nobody had very much interest in developing ideas about uh, what was happening in the labour process until Braverman came along. And Braverman uh, picked up on the work of uh, F.W. Taylor on scientific management and Braverman saw scientific management as a universal trend in work, wherever that took place, whether in capitalist production, in the public sector, wherever, he saw um, scientific management as a universal trend. And if you haven't come across F.W. Taylor, he starts off in the 19th century, uh, in the 1880s, I think it is, uh, looking at the production of uh, pig iron, and he goes out with his stopwatch and he measures how long it takes the average person uh, to produce a tonne of pig iron and so on. And it's all based on trying to measure and control labour. Okay? Now, you might think, well, that's very far-fetched uh, compared to anything that we do, but in uh, Braverman's book, he has examples taken from white-collar work where scientific management has been used to microscopically examine and measure on a stopwatch how long it takes, for example, a secretary to file a piece of paper, okay? So it has things like, you know, 0.5 seconds stand up from the chair, two seconds walk to the filing cabinet, one second open, the, and so on, okay? And Braverman gives lots of these examples <laughs> of the impact of uh, scientific management. But the key themes that he says, and these are what get picked up in relation to social work, is he says, with scientific management, there's the separation of conception and execution. In crude terms, there's a separation between thinking about what needs to happen in doing a job and doing a job. 
okay? So he says the conception of work gets funneled off into management. Management has an overall view about what needs to happen in work, how work should be planned, executed, um, and so on. And he says the next step is that uh, scientific management requires control over the execution of labour, so setting out the steps that need to be followed uh, in order for uh, jobs to be completed. And this results in the fragmentation of work into smaller, less skilled uh, tasks, with the effect that workers are uh, de-skilled. Okay, so this, I mean, it's a, quite a long book, so this is a bit of a travesty, but I'm taking this as the kind of key messages that uh, come from the book. So remember that Bravam is saying these four trends are happening across the economy, across the public sector, and so on. Uh, he's saying this in the early uh, 1970s. Now, this gets picked up in this country, okay? And uh, uh, the new social services department come to be referred to on the left quite frequently as sea bone factories, okay? Um, and the kind of loose-knit radical social work movement, um, to the extent that it's theorised at all, um, latches on to uh, Braverman as an explanation uh, for what's um, going on. Now, there are tensions within the radical social work movement. Stan Cohen, a uh, sociologist, wrote a chapter in Bailey and Brake's Radical Social Work, which he called, It's All Right for You to Talk. And he said this was a common experience he had as an academic, that practitioners would say to him, it's all right for you to talk, you know, come and try uh, doing the job with all these kind of radical ideas. But nevertheless, um, these ideas are, are powerful on the left in the 1970s and early 1980s. And they result in an industrial model of the social work labour process. You can see the quote from Simkin um, at the top, uh, from Mike Simkin's Trapped Within Welfare. But this is the dominant conceptualisation in this period, the late 1970s to early 1980s, the work that's trying to understand what's going on in social work adopts an industrial model of the social work labour process. Uh, Chris Jones, who I think was here last month in his State Social Work and the Working Class, Mike Simpkin in uh, Trapped Within Welfare, Corrigan and Leonard, um, um, Social Work Practice Under Capitalism, a Marxist approach, uh, Steve Bolger, um, Paul Corrigan, Jan Docking, and uh, Nick Frost in Towards Socialist Welfare Work, and uh, Corrigan, Joyce and Hayes in uh, Striking Out Trade Unionism in Social Work. If you pick up any of those books, okay, they have an industrial model of the social work labour process. It's completely hegemonic on the left in this period as a way of understanding what's happening um, to social work. And the argument is that because of these trends towards the imposition of an industrial model on social work, social workers are becoming proletarianised. Okay? They experience their job as workers. Their conditions and experiences become much closer to those of uh, manual uh, working class workers. Okay. Now, um, this, this um, is not just um, a kind of theoretical development in this period. If you look, for example, at the development of shop stewards committees as a kind of bottom-up initiative in this period, um, a, a movement that I was involved in uh, myself, we saw ourselves very much as workers and made sense of our experience through the kind of things that Braverman and the kind of radical social work writers were writing about. 
Um, this led to some quite odd positions at times, I think. You know, the, um, the, the fact that we saw ourselves uh, uh, almost uh, entirely in terms of being workers. So I can remember, for example, in the local authority I worked in, uh, when there was a proposal to introduce flexi time and the Social Services Shop, Shop Stewards Committee was one of the groups that opposed this um, as being further exploitation of the workers. And one of the arguments that was given by one of the shop stewards in the debate about whether we should accept this or not in the union was that if flexi time was introduced, instead of dragging yourself out of bed and getting to work at 8.30 when you've been on the lash the night before and experiencing your hangover in works time, you would go in at the beginning of core time at 11 o'clock and be having your hangover in your own time. Okay. <coughs> now, the, actually, the person who made that argument not only became a director of social services, um, he eventually became the head of the Commission for Social Care Inspection. And uh, I always had this fantasy of turning up when he was doing one of his briefings about the, uh, the inspection system or something like that and asking him where he stood on having hangovers in works uh, time. So this is a very um, significant development, I'm, I'm arguing, in terms of how things were seen in this period. Okay, so 68, SIBO, 78. So it's a nice, neat 10 year span. This is a winter of uh, discontent. Okay, 78 to 79. Um, I'm not going to talk about the winter of discontent. Uh, briefly, um, oil pr price uh, quadruples, uh, country goes bust, the IMF comes in in 1976, makes Britain a loan on condition that there's a pay policy, no pay rises above 5%, and there's a reduction in the social wage, in uh, social measures, social policy measures and so on. And there's an enormous wave of uh, reaction to this, you know, bodies are unburied, there's no ambulance service, <coughs> no fire service, um, you know, rats are in public parks because the bins aren't being collected, fuel isn't being delivered and so on. In the midst of all this and predating this uh, is the social workers dispute and I'm seeing this as the kind of pinnacle of this view of, of social workers as workers. So from August 1978 to May 1979, 2,600 social workers in 14 local authorities are on strike for some or all of that period. Okay, in three local authorities, the social workers are on strike for the full nine months. And there's lots of other industrial action as well. Okay, so I'm seeing this as a kind of um, significant moment. So I'm suggesting to you that in this kind of 1970s, early 1980s period, the dominant view of the social work labour process is constructed by these ideas about uh, proletarianisation and um, so on. <coughs> now, I was doing some research in uh, 1980 and uh, this is a quote from a frontline manager, okay? I see social workers as being autonomous. I just talk to them in supervision about the things they feel they want to talk to me about, okay? And uh, here's another one. This is a frontline manager saying, I can't ever imagine saying to a social worker, I'm not happy about this. This is what I want you to do. I can't ever imagine telling a social worker what to do, okay? Now, this is... Very interesting because you'll remember that Mike Simkin and the radical social work writers argued that um, the introduction of the Seabone report 
was little dissimilar to the introduction of the assembly line by Henry Ford. This is actually the Model T assembly line uh, by Henry Ford, okay? And I think you'll agree that it's difficult to square those kind of quotes with that experience of work. These workers clearly aren't being seen as autonomous and they clearly are being told in great detail what they should do. Now, at the time that um, my work was a study of a local authority in the Midlands, and at about the same time, um, Andy Pitthouse was doing a study of a local authority in Wales. In he, he published in his book, uh, Social Work, the Social Organisation of an Invisible Trade. He found the same thing, very permissive culture, social workers pretty much deciding what they did day to day, what their priorities were, and so on. Um, Carol Satyamurti did a study published in her book Occupational Survival in a London local authority, found the same thing. And Phila de Parslow and uh, Olive Stevenson did a study financed by the Department of Health and Social Security in 33 local areas in England and found the same thing. So this is very uh, interesting because on the one hand, theory and social work activism came up with one view, which was the industrial model of the social work labour process. The empirical data didn't seem to support that. Okay. So I found this a, personally a very uncomfortable position to be in as a kind of supporter of Braverman, as a shop steward and so on. And yet the empirical data um, suggested um, that Braverman's model of the social work, la uh, of the labour process and the way it'd been applied to social work didn't fit very well at all. Okay. So how are we to explain that? Well, um, I found very helpful the work of an uh, American called Charles Derber. And he talks about professional labour processes. And he says, the labour process literature is concerned with lack of control over the labour process. But, he says, we need to disaggregate what that means. There are actually two senses in which there's lack of control. First of all, there's lack of control over the process of labour, the actual means of labour, the detailed day-to-day -day work of labour. And secondly, there's lack of control over the uses to which the final product is put. Okay, And he says the first aspect of lack of control over the labour process results in technical proletarianisation. In other words, control is taken away in the Bravomanian sense, the day-to-day -day doing of the job. But he says there's also a sense of ideological proletarianisation in workers having no control over what the product is used for. Now, what Derber argues is that for manual workers, they experience both of these processes at the same time. They have no control over the day-to-day. -day. This, this is, a, a, I mean, the reason we could pull this apart, but if we just accept it for the time being, that they have no control over the day-to-day -day technical working methods and so on, and they have no control over the uses to which the final product is put. So he said what this enabled people who studied the labour process to do when they were studying industrial workers was to focus on technical proletarianisation because they just took all this for granted. And he says what happens with professionals is that they experience ideological proletarianisation. They don't control um, the use to which the product of their labour is put, but they don't necessarily experience technical proletarianisation. They don't necessarily experience control um, being taken over their day-to-day -day work. And he describes it like this. So he says, professionals are left with the domain of freedom and creativity um, which is realised. 
um, in the techniques that they use. Okay. Now, I think that this makes sense of these kind of quotes that, that I was getting. I've got loads and loads of quotes like this. Because, and, and what I ended up calling this was parochial professionalism. Okay, this, this isn't a kind of aspiration for grandiose professionalism and so on. It's simply at a local level, managers saying, I respect social workers, I let them get on with doing the job in the way that they think uh, makes sense to them. Um, and I see them as autonomous and so on. Now, the social workers um, didn't have, uh, uh, you know, full and absolute control, but this begins to make sense of the kind of freedom that the empirical uh, studies revealed that they had. Now, uh, Derber refers to a, pro uh, uh, um, a process of ideological, he calls it co-optation. I think he means co-option. I think we probably say co-option. So he says um, that uh, professionals uh, adapt to this um, and they learn to fit with the way in which they're being ideologically co-opted. And in the, in the case of social work, he says... Um, that, that um, the deal that social workers settled for was uh, therapeutic techniques in their practice um, and they were then used for broader ends, for the state's ends in terms of uh, uh, how the state wanted to deal with deviant groups or um, irreprehensible parents and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, so this is how um, he makes sense of what's going on within social work. So as long as social work's being used to meet the state's ends, in this period, uh, social work is being allowed some freedom and um, creativity. Okay. Now, just, just <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have warned people of a nervous disposition about this as well. L lest, <laughs> lest we forget. Um, but just before we move on to uh, the Blessed Margaret, um, <coughs> I, want, I want to actually go further than Derber went, okay? What I want to suggest to you is that in the 1970s and early 1980s, not only did social workers have some freedom and autonomy in relation to the means, the techniques of what they were doing day to day, that they also had some autonomy in terms of the ideology, the final product to which their work was put. How can I justify that? Well, for example, the team in which I was working in that period, this is local authority social work, in works time, set up a claimant's union, an unemployed workers' centre, um, women's groups, um, I was chairing case conferences of people with learning disabilities and we said to them at the end of every case conference, would you like to have a benefits check? And we found over £50,000 of unclaimed benefits, which as my mother would have said, that was a lot of money in those days. And, um, and we publicised that in the newspaper and then even more people came forward and so on. Or if you look at the work of one of my colleagues from Warwick, um, Eileen McLeod, when she was working as a probation officer in the Midlands and she was repeatedly um, seeing sex workers who were being imprisoned for soliciting and then, of course, there were all the consequences for their children and so on. And Eileen worked with um, the sex workers locally to set up an organisation called PROS, Prostitutes for the Reform on Soliciting. That was eventually a nationwide organisation. This is in works time. Uh, a nationwide organisation that achieved the abolition of imprisonment for, uh, for soliciting in the 1982 Criminal Justice Act. And if you're interested in that story, Ken Loach made a film about it uh, called Prostitute. Um, and it must be the only film that's been on general release that has a session on a social work course as part of the 
uh, film. And uh, the students from Warwick Hall <coughs> got paid their extras fees at the end of it from a big box of money that uh, Ken Loach had. Okay, so I'm arguing, okay, <laughs> that we went from an explanation in terms of the industrial model of the social work labour process um, to an explanation based on Derber's work and some other people's work, which suggests that, in fact, uh, professional labour processes or semi-professional labour processes were different, okay, and had to be explained in different ways. This is the... Um, am I nearly supposed to finish? Okay, I'll speed up. Um, I'll miss out. I, I was going to play you a, a clip from the Blessed Margaret, but <laughs> um, uh, um, most people need no reminder, I think. Okay, so Margaret Thatcher marks the ushering in of a period of neoliberalism, which is with us to the present day. So the second part of what I want to argue is that we move from this parochial, professional, permissive um, ideas about social work in which social workers were able to struggle for all sorts of um, goals and uh, in all sorts of movements and so on, um, to the neoliberalisation of the social work labour process. And neoliberalism um, involves the application of three processes, marketization, consumerization, and managerialization. And these are filtered through national contexts. Uh, social policy people would talk about path dependency here. They take different paths in different national contexts, different combinations and so on, which we could talk about if we had time. And then they impact on social work. And because we're talking about the labor process, I want to concentrate on managerialization as a process. So this, I'm suggesting, in the period of neoliberalism is an attempt to take control of, or more control, over the social work um, labour process. And this is based on a generic uh, model of management, right? <coughs> so this is uh, an argument that says um, that management is management is management wherever it takes place. We can take the knowledge, skills, techniques from the private sector apply them to the public and voluntary sectors and the model works wherever it is. And part of what's involved here is commodification, actually dividing social work into uh, products. And of course, um, this was very difficult in the traditional social democratic welfare state, but we've seen this happen increasingly, things like uh, multi-systemic therapy, solution-focused, practice, uh, Elizabeth Trow uh, Trowler's uh, Hackney model and so on, where knowledge is carved out and practices are carved out, uh, they're licensed, they turn into a commodity, only the people who license them do the research about them by and large, um, and people get incredibly rich as a result of this in um, social work. Um, I mean, other examples in other, if you think of the... Um, uh, assessment for uh, personal independence payments um, and <coughs> oh, I've forgotten the name of the two Atos and Capita yeah well, thank you <laughs> Atos and Capita you know in the last three years they made half a billion pounds right out of commoditizing the assessments of disabled people you might want to look at how much they've managed to recoup from disabled people <laughs> in order to get there uh, half a billion pounds. So, um, and there are the examples in my own local authority, um, I better not name the company, a company came in that commoditizes assessments or reviews or whatever it is you want doing, they send 50 or 60 social workers in with their own manager and so on, um, and they churn through whatever it is you want them to churn through. Or a recent example in my local authority uh, last week was that a manager sent out an email to all social workers saying that statutory 
visits to children should take no more than 15 minutes, and that was the uh, uh, commodification of uh, statutory uh, visits. Now, uh, another feature of managerialization is efficiency gain. During the period of new labor, they constantly um, did things like cutting 2% a year from the budget of uh, social work, 3% some years and so on. Uh, and now, of course, this austerity uh, performs this function uh, for uh, the government. And I want to suggest to you that this kind of mimics the tendency towards the falling rate of profit in the private sector. In other words, there's this constant downward pressure <coughs> on cost uh, cloaked in the language of efficiency. We could spend a long time talking about that. The thing I want to concentrate on, because we're talking about the labour process, is greater control over professional space. Okay, this is... And uh, there's an article by um, uh, Malcolm Carey in uh, the journal Organisation, uh, and he has this in the title. This is a quote from one of the people he interviewed, a social worker who says it's a bit like being a robot or working in a factory in terms of a greater control over professional space. So we've got the idea of factory creeping back in again. Here's one example of the intensification of work and the intense uh, increased scrutiny of work. So are you all familiar with these uh, dashboards or not? I never know how much of this is my kind of experience and how much it's happening all over the country. So these are, these are called dashboards and um, the facility they give is for any manager. So if a director, for example, wants to zoom in and see what the state of play is on any number of measures or if there's an individual worker who's spending too long doing certain sorts of work and so on, they can immediately pull this uh, data up from uh, dashboards, okay? So this is obviously, uh, I mean, I was, I was talking to Steve before, Stephen, sorry, not Steve, Stephen before the session, we were both sharing our experience of, uh, I went back into social work, um, having some time out of the university and we were sharing our, our experiences of the shock of going into these highly computerised systems <laughs> where every aspect of your performance uh, can be monitored. You know, this makes supervision a very different experience in my experience, you know. Um, so I was saying to Stephen, you know, my supervisor would say to me, oh, I see that telephone call's outstanding. And that, that kind of level of... Uh, detail that's provided by this kind of thing. There are other things we could point, if I had more time and I hadn't uh, gone in for reminiscence therapy about the 1970s, and then I thank, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so, uh, obviously, you know, it goes without saying, but we'll say it, that the emphasis is on strict gatekeeping and ration of resources. That's very much the experience of most social workers now and standardised and computerised procedures. Again, you know, when I went back into social work, uh, the fusing together of financial computerised systems and practice systems, so actually you couldn't get anything to happen for anybody unless you jumped through all the uh, financial hoops. Now, the two things I want to spend a little bit more time on, um, and then I think we'll probably be uh, finished, you'll be relieved to know, is uh, performance management and call centres, because I think these two developments kind of epitomise neoliberal approaches to the social work labour process. So, the technical term um, for what we all experience in social work now is managerial cybernetics. I thought it was worth putting that term there for you. I mean, if you go back tonight and you uh, live with someone and they say to you, well, what were you doing? Instead of saying, I was listening to this old guy from Warwick uh, drone on about the labour process, you can say, I've been doing a little bit of managerial cybernetics. And I think this will be much more impressive. Okay. So we, we all know this. Okay. Uh, Marx would say, as every child knows. So organisational objectives that are turned into performance indicators, targets set in terms of the 
performance indicators, progress towards the targets monitored, and feedback given serviced by the system of performance indicators, this kind of circular loop, right? We're all familiar with it from inspections and government policy and all the rest of it. Uh, in the uh, book chapter that I referenced at the top of the page, we give an example from a team manager who every month uh, gets a performance management report, 1,600 pieces of data against 22 targets. My son, who's a team manager in child protection, saw this slide and he said, oh, that few. Um, and then he showed me his uh, system and indeed it went on for screen after screen after screen. And he said, well, the, you know, the point is it's meant to make us feel competitive um, towards each other. I want to give you an example of the potential impact of targets. This, I don't know if you remember this, there was, I can't remember which year it was, but there was one year when Tony Blair was Prime Minister and he got a bee in his bonnet about adoption. He mentioned it in two or three speeches and so on. And he decided that there would be a specific target for local authorities in terms of adoption. And I was teaching um, a post-qualifying course at uh, Warwick and we got to the morning coffee break and I was conscious in the corner that there were a group of workers from an adoption team from one of the local authorities we're in partnership with and you could just tell there was something about the body language. I could tell they were really worked up about something. I thought, sorry I was going to swear now. I thought, <laughs> I thought oh dear, they, they're not liking this post-qualifying course. I'd better go and talk to them. So I went over and said, you know, are you unhappy about the course? No, no, no. I said, I said, what's wrong? So they said, oh, we we're just talking about what's happening at work. And so they said, they'd obviously been set the adoption targets as part of the Blair Initiative. And they said, all this week, our manager's been going around saying to people, surely there must be a child somewhere that we can get adopted so that we can meet the target. And of course, what they were upset about was that wasn't about the needs of the child, it was about the need to meet the target. Now, one of the things we know, Mike Powers' work on the Audit Society and so on, is the way in which organisations then perform to target. And it turns out that there's a whole literature in the business field where this comes from, and even those, including uh, where I got this from, even the keenest supporters of managerial cybernetics say there are enormous problems about it, which we very rarely hear about in social work, but it's there in the business literature. And so they are things, I mean, we could talk about all these in great depth, but the, these kind of things. So, for example, if we think about gaming, the team manager that I talked about said, what I look for every month when I get that information is, am I in the middle? He said, it's really bad news if you're at the bottom, but you don't want to be in the top. If you're on the, in the top, the only way to go is down. And if you're in the top, you might be asked to help somebody else as well as doing your own job, and then you do another job on top of your own job. Okay. There was a local authority that I did a lot of work with that had exactly that strategy in relation to inspection. Right? I would sit with the senior managers and they'd say, we're trying to be in the middle. We don't want to be at the top because then we might have to take over another local authority's work and we certainly don't want to be at the bottom. So I think there's a whole unexplored issue that we can't get into now about the way in which managerial cybernetics can be a force for mediocrity, not a force for excellence. Okay. And uh, call centres. Well, you could see these as the epit epitome of uh, consumerism. Um, but the thing I want to mention briefly is the way in which call centres undermine a sense of place. Because Liverpool uh, was one of the pioneers of uh, call centres uh, with um, Liverpool Direct Limited. And I've lost track of it now, but the 10 year contract must be up. I don't know what's happened since. You might want to talk about that in the discussion time. But under that contract, for example, British Telecom was guaranteed £30 million per year in profit 
um, by introducing the call centre. And of course, one of the other things that happened was they reduced staff from 19,000 to 13,000, so on and so forth. But what I'm interested in here is the way that call centres undermine the sense of place. Much is made of the fact that call centres can be available 24 hours and that uh, they transcend time and space and so on. But of course, in social work, particularly progressive versions of social work, the notion of being in a particular community and being um, committed to that community and wanting to uh, advance the interests of that community has been uh, very important. So I think we should be concerned about the way in which call centres undermine the sense of place. Now, that's happening in all sorts of other ways as well. I don't know in the northwest whether you get much home working. We've got a local authority near to me that has all its social workers working from home uh, now. I have a friend who has become a team leader for a social work team 100 miles away. She's never met anybody in the team. Um, the uh, assessments that they do get sent to her online. She approves them electronically or questions them electronically. So it's a whole different way of understanding social work as this kind of placeless, commodified uh, kind of labour process. And the other thing I'd want to mention is uh, Paul Michael Garrett talks about the impact of IT on social work. Finished. Okay. Just cut me off. <laughs> okay. Um, Paul Michael Garrett um, did an article about the impact of IT on children's services, and he talks about the introduction of a te techno habitat. And um, Nigel Coleman and I, when we were writing about um, this particular call center, talked about the idea not just of a techno habitat, but a techno habitus in the in the Bordeaux sense, okay, the temperament and set of thoughts and so on. It's because um, what, what, what became apparent from this particular call center that was that the skills that were highly prized were the technical skills of how you did the software, how quickly you could finish the call and so on. And uh, the call center we looked at was exactly like a commercial call center. It wasn't like the Liverpool Direct model, it was purely for social work. There were display boards saying the average um, amount of time a call was waiting, the average amount of time that people were spending dealing with a call and so on. And if the workers or social workers went over the stipulated length of time for a phone call, this annoying bleep would sound in their ears to get them off the phone, right? Now this is, it doesn't matter how distressed people were or whatever, they would get this kind of boom, boom, boom in, in their ear, okay, in order to get them to turn. So this is, you know, a techno habitat that's commodified and all the rest of it. So we might say that the call centre epitomises what Ritzer talks about in the McDonaldization of society, that uh, the principles, the four principles of the fast food restaurant are coming to more and more uh, dominate area, different areas in society. These are efficiency, calculability, predictability and control by non-human technology. Now, I mean, call centres fit this notion of McDonaldization very well, but we might say that in the neoliberal period this is a tendency, or these four areas are a tendency in social work more generally. Okay. So is there any hope? <laughs> well, two assumptions about the control of the labour process, that, that w whether in the 1970s, 80s or in the current period, there tends to be a stereotype of strong autonomous self-regulation and it tends to be presented in terms of all or nothing. It's either like the assembly line or it's like being a robot and so on and so forth. There's another set of work by Michael Lipsky about street-level bureaucracy. It might be more accurate in social work now to talk about screen-level bureaucracy rather than street-level bureaucracy. But he argues that you cannot abolish discretion completely from human services. There's a certain amount of discretion needed to do the job because of people's varying needs and so on. 
There's a discretion needed to translate policy into practice, uh, which sort of which policy applies, what does it mean, what's it significant, how do exactly does it apply, and so on. And he says that street level bureaucrats like social workers have discretion to advance their own values and interests. He calls this subversion, right? They have the potential for subversion. And Oh, I'm finishing now. <laughs> so, we can say that there's a framework within which practice is located, and that's shaped by the law, by policy, and by managers. But we might want to question how far that can ever be coherent and complete and unambiguous, okay? There's always a temptation to present the current period as though it's the end of um, any possibilities for uh, social work. The drift in my argument is that in the neoliberal period, there is the intention to gain greater control over the labour process and reduce social workers' discretion. But we need to be careful about equating intention with achievement. Okay, just because <laughs> there's an attempt to gain greater control over the labour process doesn't mean that it's completely and uh, fully reasoned. And we started off with Marx, and um, I'll finish with Marx. So what we might conclude is contradictions are met with at every moment in actual reality. Okay, thanks very much.